um, we now have some a uh, bit of time to have two presentations for um, the national committee uh, new members from the national committees and, and the ISC. Uh, Ecomos Bolivia is here, uh, with Fabiana and, um, and Cynthia, who will be presenting for us uh, uh, the perspective of SDGs and heritage from their uh, from the Bolivian perspective. Uh, Fabiana. Uh, hello, Dave. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for the space. So I will share my my screen uh, with the presentation. Thank you. Well, I'm going to do a short, brief uh, presentation of myself. I'm an architect by profession, researcher. Uh, um, sorry, sorry, Fabiana. Uh, maybe we can switch screens first. I think you can click on um, display settings. And then from display settings, you reverse your uh, screen. You can see your um, presenter view, I think. Uh, uh, OK. And, and then swap, swap. view. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. We can see it. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, now I'm okay. Okay. Well, uh, I was uh, just um, saying that. Well, in this in this uh, slide like a bit of my um, my professional experience in heritage. I am a specialist in conservation and restoration of heritage, structural analysis of historical monuments. And uh, nowadays I'm doing a PhD uh, researching about monitoring and evaluation strategies uh, through artificial intelligence to, from existing uh, structures. Uh, in Bolivia, I had the opportunity to to be involved in many uh, in many well in some uh, projects in uh, archaeological sites in rural areas uh, where I, I experienced uh, one a really important uh, issue and um, thing that mark my 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 professional vision and principles that is the shared responsibility and the communitarian work uh, with the locals uh, from a bottom up uh, uh, perspective um, that is kind of innovative in in terms of uh, conservation and restoration um, uh, projects and intervention so here uh three pictures where you can see uh, the restorations, uh, restoration and um, works in archaeological sites where all the community collaborates since the diagnosis and through the implementation uh, until finishing on uh, the, the, the project. Now I'm going to give the word to, to Cynthia, that is the, the, the other uh, representative from Bolivia. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's it's a pleasure for me to be part of this grouping work, working group. I'm Cynthia. I'm a Bolivian and an architect. My experience can be divided in two parts: the academic and the professional. Since 2010, I have been a professor at the UPSA School and architecture in Santa Cruz, Bolivia. I work on cultural heritage in the research man in management models, cultural mapping, non-formal training, and inter intergenerational knowledge transfer. My, pla my place, uh, the, the next, Fabiana, please. OK. My place of work in Bolivia is uh, for the last 10 years in uh, Plan Misiones. Uh, I have been linked in management office of the work heritage site uh, of the Jesuit missions of Chiquitos uh, in different areas and with different responsibilities. Uh, principally uh, elaboration and implementation of the management plan and coordination for the Escuela Taller de la Chiquitanía 
Currently, I advise on a specific issues. I have also worked at Fundación Altiplano in Chile in the research and sustainable development team for about a year. With this institution, I continue to collaborate on some projects. Uh, really sorry for my English. I hope to improve mm -hmm. little by little. Uh, and it's a pleasure to meet all for you. And I hope that the contributions and collaborative work of this work will be beneficial for all. Thank you, Fabiana. Thank you, Cynthia. So now I'm going to present a bit uh, what is the, the, the sustainable um, development projects and some numbers and about the World Heritage and the wide heritage that we have in Bolivia. In Bolivia, we have six uh, declared cultural world heritage uh, sites by the UNESCO. One site uh, is declared as natural. Seven uh, expression, cultural expressions are declared as intangible uh, heritage of humanity. And one of the cultural world heritage are, is in risk. Um, our our country is uh, mainly uh, covered by uh, uh, forest lands. Uh, with the 40%, uh, 30% are agricola, uh, agricultural lands and only 18% is covered by cities. Um, the, now I'm going to present uh, some case studies uh, where we localize uh, some SDG, uh, well, the, the goals, the sustainable development goals. The first one is uh, the, the plan in Potosí that was uh, declared, the first uh, World Heritage declared uh, by UNESCO in 1987, uh, where uh, we can, in this project in particular, we localize the, 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 the goals number 6, 10, and uh, 17. Since uh, the project was focused in, uh, of course, the, the, the recovery and restoration of the whole historical uh, site, but with a, a particular focus in the, in the treatment of waters, since, uh, since this uh, historical site, site is next to a uh, mining, um, uh, mining industry that is uh, being exploited since the conquer since the Spanish conquer so uh, the the people in in Potosí were super affected by the contaminants uh, due to the mining uh, nowadays this site is uh, is declared uh, in risk since that besides the project and the managing in, uh, plans the mining industry grow a lot and uh, it's been um, contaminating the soil the water and the whole surroundings uh, in Potosí. The next, uh, the next uh, case studies, Plan Misiones, where Cynthia has been working for 10 years. Uh, in, this one, in this one, we placed, uh, we localized uh, the, um, the goals number four, 10, and 11, since uh, the, uh, the plan, the strategic plan to, uh, of intervention in Misiones involved a lot uh, the local communities and uh, also uh, raised uh, and focus uh, on the education and the capacity building in the uh, territory, as uh, we can see in the in the pictures here, also was combined with a cultural touristic management that connect all the uh, missions, uh, Jesuit missions in the territory. Uh, they also uh, build um, a school, restoration school, where all the, the, the locals can be trained and then uh, they can intervene to their own heritage. Uh, the next one uh, is also uh, in the same territory as Misiones, uh, related with the Jesuitic uh, Misiones in, in, in Bolivia, uh, uh, and is declared as uh, immaterial, uh, intangible cultural heritage of the humanity in 2012. Is the Chapequene uh, Fiesta, uh, that is a big party uh, in the region of uh, San Ignacio de Moxos. 
And in this um, case study also we localize the, um, the goals number 14 and 11 because of the same reasons as uh, planned missiones. They, uh, in, this, uh, in this particular uh, case, uh, they involve in the whole process, the community, the local community with the participatory management, uh, exposition, ferries, education, uh, guidelines. And nowadays, the um, local communities are the ones that maintain uh, the whole uh, cultural expression and the party and the music and the, all the all the all the all the elements that are part of this this these expressions um since that in in our country uh, sadly the uh, govern governmental uh, involvement involvement in heritage is uh, super few and in some uh, parts especially in rural areas um uh, there is, is, is nothing. So the local involvement is uh, super important to maintain and, uh, and to sustain the projects. The next case study is uh, Luca River, uh, Lauca River uh, Chulpares. It's a complex of um, uh, polychromatic funerary towers where we also place uh, the goals number 14 and 11 do uh, they also the the inclusion and the participation of local communities um, that uh, participate uh, in the um, practical uh, work uh, and also the planning of this of this restoration was uh, totally uh, um, collaborating with them since many of the practices that they uh, they use for example in the in the preparation of the pigments uh, were uh, in the memory the life memory of the community so the restorers the, the technicians call for the knowledge of the of the communities around to uh, to plan and to propose the uh, restoration um, intervention. And if I, uh, I have only two case studies more, uh, is this project, Biocultural and Sustainable Development uh, Project, uh, where we place uh, goals number two, 12, and uh, 13. So uh, since this project is basically uh, focused on attending uh, the climate crisis and the negative uh, impacts on the land and vulnerable communities, through an holistic attention and with a bottom-up uh, perspective. Uh, in these uh, particular projects, uh, we are trying to collaborate uh, with a um, Latin American network uh, that, uh, of uh, different kinds of projects that are focused on food sovereignty, agriculture, and landscape restoration, uh, attention to hunger and poverty. And uh, finally, uh, another uh, interesting project that is more focused on business, where we place a uh, goal number nine and number 12, that is uh, looking uh, for recover uh, the life memory and uh, the use of earth uh, as a finishing material in construction in urban areas. Uh, uh, the project uh, tried to recover many of the traditional uh, techniques and uh, place it and, uh, in uh, the business market of, uh, of uh, construction. Uh, by now, only as finishing uh, as, as a finishing uh, material, but they are looking for um, to propose it also as a, a construction uh, material. Is needed some uh, work with the normative, and well, that's it. And in the last slide, uh, I, I leave uh, some of the all the reference where you can check all the projects and case studies that I presented. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Fabiana and Cynthia. I think that these are um, um, good initiatives that we see a different side. For me, I haven't been to Bolivia, and to have a, a glimpse of that is is very very insightful. I know that we have some questions, uh, but uh, maybe what we can do is uh, have uh, Marion and Yasmin to present uh, with uh, Iklafi first, and then we uh, finish off with uh, some uh, discussions. I hope that's fine, yeah? Yes, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go to uh, Marion uh, and Yasmin, uh, and we can have your presentation um, here. Hello, everyone. Uh, Marion, shall I share? 
Hi, everybody. That would be wonderful, Yasmin. And I'm, I'm setting up my camera again. One second. Okay. All right. I think it's clear now. Okay. Um, Yasmin and I put this uh, presentation together and I'll st say right off the bat that we are still learning a lot about this working group and trying to figure out what our best um, value is that we can add to the discussion. But as a way of getting started, we thought we would introduce ourselves and some of the types of projects that we work on and then would love to get some feedback from you about the best way that we can participate. So we are the focal points for ICLOFI, the Legal, Administrative, and Financial Work um, Committee. And um, I am Marian Werkheiser. I'm an attorney, and I'm founding partner at Cultural Heritage Partners, which is a boutique law firm that I founded a little over 10 years ago, and we work on issues at the intersection of development, sustainability, and historic preservation. We have offices in Richmond, Virginia, Washington, D.C., and New York, and we serve clients mostly in the United States, but also uh, internationally. Okay. So my work focuses on policy advocacy. So in the United States, I do a lot of federal lobbying to try to get increased support for the National Historic Preservation Program here, and also to improve the permitting process in the United States. Um, I am the lobbyist for an advocacy coalition that has more than 350,000 heritage professionals, scholars, small business consultants, and nonprofits from across the United States. So we're regularly interfacing with Congress with the White House um, to, to work on heritage policy here in the United States. I also do a lot of work on federal permitting negotiations. So I represent Native American tribes. I represent local governments, other NGOs, to try to find outcomes that will balance preservation values and development needs. Um, I also um, work to, cr to negotiate creative mitigation settlements, and one of the areas that I've focused on um, in the last few years is mitigation for offshore wind development in the United States, and our firm has negotiated the settlements on the first two offshore wind farms in the United States. And then finally, I work on environmental social governance, corporate governance issues. Uh, for that, I work directly with investors, financial institutions, and companies to conduct due diligence on their investments, to assess risk on projects that's related to cultural heritage and to um, engagement with indigenous people, and work to try to improve internal governance at those companies so that we can reduce the impacts of projects on indigenous people and on cultural heritage sites. And we do a lot of work tying standards like the SDGs, the equator principles, to the methods that investors are using so that they can um, appropriately evaluate their projects and their risks. Um, so that's about me. Now I'm going to turn it over to Yasmin to introduce herself. Okay. Um... Uh, I'm Yasin Sirke Levant, uh, and I would like to salute you all from Turkey, Mersin, a southern coastal city uh, in Turkey. Uh, I'm again here uh, as a focal point of Iklafi, uh, and I'm very excited to learn more about uh, these very interesting uh, subjects about heritage and sustainability uh, relation. Uh, I'm a city planner and uh, I had my graduate and postgraduate degrees from Middle East Technical University in Ankara. My uh, PhD subject was about integration of archaeological sites in urban life and also urban planning processes. Um, I have been working as an assistant professor in the Department of City and Regional Planning in Mersin University. Uh, my main subject is urban conservation, but I am uh, giving lectures about urban conservation, archaeological site management, urbanization history, and also legal and administrative aspects of conservation. Um, 
And I would like to share some uh, my perspectives on uh, cultural heritage in general. Uh, actually, being a urban planner in uh, specialized on conservation issues is a difficult task, uh, especially in countries like Turkey, because um, there is a daily life ongoing and there are lots of demands and interests of people, uh, especially private owners. And uh, we are trying to find a delicate balance between preservation and uh, development, uh, which is very difficult really in Turkey. Uh, also, uh, I believe that uh, maybe different than many others uh, in society, heritage is something not old, but something we have to learn uh, from. Uh, it, uh, it sheds light. Uh, for future uh, by including experiences of past communities. And I believe that uh, we can find ways to connect that past experience with present knowledge and create a better future, which is very related with sustainability. And also, I believe that uh, preservation of cultural heritage is not possible without uh, considering the daily life, the users, and their integration into the conservation process. Uh, preserving only the uh, material well-being of heritage items uh, is not enough. We have to consider uh, the uh, daily life surrounding it, the users who are going to use it, and so find, uh, again, a balance between their needs and uh, conservation. Uh, so local dynamics are very important for me in my uh, conservation uh, studies. Uh, so uh, having these mottos in my studies, uh, I have taken different roles in uh, several projects as researcher or consultant. And today, uh, I would like to share with you uh, two of uh, those projects related with sustainable development goals. Uh, the first one is uh, Yumuktepe and its environments protection presentation and tourism infrastructure development project. Um, this was a, a, a small scale uh, local uh, municipality led project. Yumuktepe is a multi-layered uh, 9,000 years old mound, uh, including different layers. Uh, and it is located in the city of Mersin, in the very center of the city, uh, near Efrank River. Um, the mound is surrounded, as you can see from the picture, the mound is surrounded with informal housing development. This, this is a neighborhood uh, informally developed during 1980s. Uh, when there was a mass migration from rural areas to urban, uh, urbanized ones to, to cities. Uh, so uh, the neighborhood uh, currently includes vul vulnerable groups, uh, low-income households, ethnic groups like Kurds, or some um, minorities as Romans, gypsies, and of course, Syrian refugees. We have lots of Syrian refugees in uh, Mersin. We are very close to Syria. So there are lots of uh, refugees in Turkey and in Mersin. Uh, the neighborhood is a neglected one uh, and um, uh, with low living standards, limited public services, uh, informal housing and also security problems uh, because of the neglectance of the uh, mound itself. Uh, it is not uh, used uh, currently, even though it is surrounded by fences. Uh, it creates a security problem for the uh, neighborhood. On the other hand, uh, when we started the project, we observed uh, or we found that um, uh, there is a continuity of traditional production uh, in the neighborhood uh, surrounding the mound, traditional cuisine, including uh, winter preparations or uh, reed basketry conducted by those uh, gypsies or Roman people living in this neighborhood. Uh, so um, in this project, uh, we aim to uh, prepare a development strategy, redevelopment strategy for the neighborhood, which would support social and economic uh, integration uh, with the city. Uh, and uh, we aim to use, uh, we, we focused on uh, Yumuktepe and we used Yumuktepe as a starting point for the regeneration of the neighborhood. 
Um, as the final uh, outcome of the project, uh, we activated a trade and uh, education center, especially for women uh, living in these uh, neighborhoods, uh, to conduct their traditional handcrafts and traditional cuisines or traditional customs, and uh, to gain some money from those uh, activities in order to support uh, household income. Uh, so the project at the end supported uh, sustainable development goals eight and 10 uh, mainly, but also uh, five, four, one, and two are also uh, supported uh, in this project. The second example is again from a uh, southeastern part of Turkey, Haram Walled City. Uh, it is one of the major ancient cities in Upper Mesopotamia, currently located in the modern city of Haran, Şanlıurfa. Um, uh, Haram Walled City is uh, in the tentative list. It is in the tentative list of World Heritage Sites. Uh, the area is very unique with its uh, conic houses. Uh, it is one of the unique examples in Turkey. We have some other examples in Syria, uh, even though some of them were destructed during the uh, inner war process. Um, we also observed in this area that uh, there are lots of uh, continuity of traditional uh, customs, traditional production uh, productions, and also traditional architectural uh, techniques, uh, which were also important uh, as intangible heritage items in the uh, site. Uh, the area, again, similar to Yumuktepe case, the area was including uh, vulnerable groups, low-income groups, uh, minorities, some ethnic groups, and also, again, uh, refugees from uh, Syria. Um, the the uh, walled city had lots of problems about conservation, the, the structural problems, physical problems, but uh, it was not the only problem. Uh, households were in very bad condition, uh, living standards were low again, schooling, level of schooling and uh, level of women employment uh, were very uh, low. Uh, so uh, when we um, integrated into the project as consultant, uh, the project was in a way of physical maintenance and we suggested to uh, impose some social and economic aspects into this project uh, to create a sustainable development in the area alongside the conservation of the conic houses and the uh, layout of the uh, city. And uh, let me go. Uh, so there was an opportunity for tourism based uh, tourism activities in the area and in the project in the southern part uh, here you can see as blue, uh, we suggested a community center complex, including uh, different units inside like handcrafts, uh, traditional architecture uh, practices. Uh, teenager and child care units, uh, women education units, uh, etc. So it is going to be a complex, including different units inside, uh, which will maintain the continuity of the intangible heritage also in the area, but also contributing to the social and economic uh, aspects of the uh, community living in this area. It was a small scale uh, central local partnership project. Uh, Southeastern Development Agency was very important in this project because they were already conducting uh, some implementations in Southeastern Turkey in order to increase uh, social and economic uh, conditions in the villages. So they became the partner and uh, started to implement uh, this project uh, in uh, Haran. Uh, again, uh, this project uh, especially supported uh, SDG 11 uh, because it was directly related with uh, the tangible heritage, the buildings uh, themselves, and also uh, SDG 8 and 10. Uh, and also uh, there were some site uh, supporting SDGs like uh, 12, uh, 13, 4 and uh, 1. And uh, these are the uh, projects I would like to uh, present. And now, uh, Marion, uh, it's your turn. Uh, 
Um, Marion, sorry, we can't, we can't hear you. Um, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Um, thank you, Yasmin. Those were really terrific examples. Um, and now just very briefly, I'm going to talk about a couple of examples um, from the United States where we're dealing with these questions. Um, the first one is wind energy, which I know is not unique to the United States. Um, of course, as part of the, the global push for sustainability, wind energy is on the rise. In the United States, it supplied over 7% of electricity um, in 2019 and has become the largest source of renewable energy in our nation. We think wind energy developments are only going to accelerate, particularly because President Biden has decided to make that a priority of his administration. What our firm has learned about wind energy is that developers are often running into challenges related to heritage and preservation, and that leads to conflict with local communities. And several proposed offshore wind projects have failed as a result. Um, one example is the Cape Wind development, which was meant to be the first offshore wind development in the United States. After 16 years of trying to construct the project and over $100 million invested, the developers abandoned the project. Um, they abandoned it because it was opposed by wealthy homeowners in the area, but also by um, local Native American tribes who were concerned about the impact that the project would have on their traditional cultural practices. Um, the company planned to build the wind farm in Nantucket Sound which is a traditional cultural property of the Wampanoag people. Um, those people are the people of first light and being able to see an unobstructed view of the sunrise is very important for their cultural practice. So um, while that was not the only reason that the, the wind farm failed, um, we've seen similar opposition emerge in response to nearly every other proposed offshore wind development projects in the United States. Um, concerns about visual impacts to uh, historic properties. So the bottom line that, that I wanted to share with you is that uh, wind developments can be enormously beneficial for the shift to renewable energy and to help us achieve the sustainable development goals. Um, but we are seeing that without a holistic approach and respect for local heritage and preservation concerns, these projects are at a risk of failure. So ultimately, it's going to require more creative problem solving between developers and communities that value these resources um, to be able to advance that really important transition to renewable energy. Um, the other topic that I just briefly wanted to address is the role of indigenous people. Um, through our work, we are seeing ways that indigenous people are really linchpin players in advancing the achievement of the sustainable development goals and their concerns about cultural heritage preservation are at the forefront. Um, here in the United States, um, the, the permitting processes that are established under the National Historic Preservation Act and the National Environmental Policy Act provide some important um, evaluations and checks on development projects, and they require consultation with local communities. Um, depending on the level of impacts, it also triggers um, consultation with federally recognized tribes in the United States. Um, but as we have seen repeatedly from cases like the Dakota Access Pipeline, the Standing Rock Sioux protests a couple of years ago, um, indigenous groups have been pivotal in bringing attention to ways that certain projects by the government can damage water sources, create hazardous waste that will impact generations to come, and of course, um, potentially damage sacred heritage sites. So litigation in our courts initiated by these groups is becoming more and more effective and developers and investors are paying attention because they've been losing billions of dollars on these failed projects. So one of the areas that, that I'm thinking a lot about is how do we do a better job of engaging with indigenous people on these projects, making sure their voices are heard and that they are helping us in partnership achieve these sustainable development goals. One of those ways is, of course, um, trying to 
make real in the United States the international standard of free prior and informed consent, which is enshrined in the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So we've been um, also thinking about how this higher standard could provide further checks on the government and um, would allow us to um, better achieve the sustainable development goals. And I think that is, um, that it, those are, that's, oh, sorry. And then also, of course, um, I mentioned earlier, environmental, social, and governance compliance. Um, we work with a lot of multinational banks and investors, pension funds, who are looking at how they can help achieve the sustainable development goals. And a really important part of that is um, bringing heritage into the conversation and making sure that their impacts to heritage um, are, are accounted for and are mitigated in those projects. So I've been thinking more about holistic approaches to those. Um, so now I guess I would say Yasmin and I are both um, representatives from ECLAFI. And Gabe has challenged us to think about ways that a coffee can contribute to this working group. Um, we are very enthusiastic to participate, uh, but would certainly welcome your thoughts about the best ways that uh, our expertise could be uh, utilized to help achieve the goals of this working group. Yasmin, did you want to add anything there? Um uh, yes, I would like to add one uh, point about uh, legal and administrative aspects of financial issues. Um, actually, uh, ICLAFI is uh, very active in uh, these uh, topics. And uh, as a, a scientific committee, we are contributing to the uh, works of uh, ICOMOS uh, very actively and also uh, other scientific committees uh, while they are uh, restructuring their uh, legal documents. Uh, but other than this, uh, I think uh, IGLAFI would be very uh, functional in SDG uh, working group uh, to provide some uh, instruments about um, legal and administrative and also financial sources in order to realize uh, or uh, realize those policies support uh, suggested by uh, this working group because previously uh, I had uh, the chance to uh, read the policy guidance prepared by this working group, and there were lots of policy statements uh, indicated in that uh, guidance. However, um, we are always proposing or we are suggesting such kind of policies all the time, yet realizing those policies uh, requires a, a real legal and administrative system and finance also. Uh, so maybe here we can contribute uh, what kind of uh, legal and administrative tools will be effective in realizing those uh, policies. Just, just a thinking, just a thought about it. Uh, so uh, that's all from me, I think. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Marion and Yasmin. I think that's, that's a, um, a good ending to that uh, 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 thought process. Um, both um, national committee and international scientific committees have a role to play in the SDGs. Um, and um, I think uh, I will not make a lot of comments for the moment. And uh, I know that we have uh, or almost coming to two hours. But uh, let me ask, uh, open the floor to, to both um, the presentations and then um, ask people to um, um, ask uh, uh, pertinent questions. So um, uh, are there any uh, questions for Fabiana and Cynthia? Uh, I know that they've already responded to some of the comments that have been given. Um, any questions for the moment? Yes, only to to say I, I try to to answer the questions in the chat, um, and yes, in general, maybe like the only comment if there is another uh, if there is not another um, question is that uh, basically the the localization of the goals uh, was the result of analysis that we did with uh, Cynthia uh, and. Um, 
because of the compatibility of the results and the, the objectives of the uh, and the purposes of the goals. Uh, the, the local participation in all projects uh, is it's related also with a normative that we have in Bolivia that requires a participatory uh, perspective in many projects uh, of intervention, especially if you intervene in rural areas. So that's why in almost all of the projects there is this factor of the local involvement, uh, but not always is, um, is an active participation. So those cases that are presented were, were the locals uh, actively participate in the projects. Uh, the education now um, um, pro um, proposals that this, those projects uh, propose and implement in some cases are uh, within uh, um, curricular pensum of uh, like kind of technical professional uh, um, um, capacity. Uh, after the high school and um, some of the marketplace and, and uh, seminars and ferries uh, were placed in the schools but they are not yet uh, formally within the, uh, the curricular pensum of, of the high schools, schools or primaries or universities. Uh, thanks. Uh, I think it's really important to have the participation. I think it was quite clear in the presentation as well that the, 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 the cases that you provided are really showing that the, the angle, of, the social angle of um, uh, sustainability. Um, uh, uh, for other questions for Marin and Yasmin, maybe I just have one question. When you add the final um, um, uh, slide, I think you hit, hit it in the head, uh, uh, the nail in the head, which is we need people who have uh, backgrounds on the legal aspects of things to, to really implement things on the ground. There, there are policies, we have charters, we have doctrines uh, that we uh, put in ECOMOS, but how that translates to, to nationally or how is it really implemented on the ground is something that needs a, a, another eye. Um, you know, we, you are the experts in the matter, and we hope that you can contribute uh, your expertise to us to, uh, for the SDGs. Um, is there any question for uh, Marion and Yasmin from, from the floor? I just tried to answer the questions already written on the chat box. <laughs> I was typing all the time <laughs> yes. to catch them all, but sorry if I missed any of those questions. I'm just looking again. I think it's uh, it's good. So uh, we have had uh, um, uh, a couple of questions, but I, I think this is a starting point for for everyone. So these are good introductions uh, um, uh, from the, uh, both both sides, and uh, um, definitely our your your experiences, your your contributions will increase. Oh, Didri had a question. Oh, Didri, do you want to ask one very uh, burning question, please? Okay, well, I mean, burning is probably a matter of <laughs> opinion, Dave, but, you know, no, I was very interested in, in um, Yasmin sort of explaining her, the, the project in Hassan, is it? Um, Haran. Haran, sorry. Um, there was a similar um, sort of uh, thing that was going on in, in, in a con I was working in Africa a long time ago, actually, but the agency was actually um, requiring that modern materials be used. And therefore I was wondering to what extent, um, you know, this is, is, is a force within Haran. And, um, you know, and also as a by question, would the European, or would the quality principles that have just been um, launched in Europe um, be of any use in, you know, in adjudicating projects such as this, or in adjudicating or um, informing, I suppose, informing the development of the project. Um, in a Haran case, uh, actually, the main intention was to uh, support tourism activities. Uh, yeah, it was started uh, with that intention. Uh, but then uh, when we started uh, when we involved in the project as consultant, uh, we suggested uh, 
not to use tourism as the main activity in the area, but also to support other local economies, other local activities. For example, agriculture, traditional agriculture, uh, some handcrafts uh, and um, some other, uh, especially the, the traditional uh, arch uh, architectural uh, techniques. Um, However, uh, currently the area is not very touristic, only a daily basis they are visiting Harran. Uh, and uh, it is still under implementation. The project is not over. Uh, it is still uh, ongoing. Uh, so they are developing uh, stage by stage. They are implementing stage by stage. And we are also following the process. We are not uh, responsible from the project at all. We are not consulting it uh, at all. Uh, but we will uh, follow up the uh, process, actually. Uh, did I miss any uh, other points? Uh, but I, I couldn't understand the uh, question, the, the part related with European uh, part. I'm sorry, I couldn't uh, catch that question. Well, it was, it, I suppose it was, it was really related. It probably isn't. If the, if the project isn't funding the actual structural um, repair of the uh, buildings, then, you know, the European principles may be, I know they are designed when you're, when uh, to make sure that money that is being provided by European agencies to support um, heritage makes sure that it doesn't in, uh, further damage it and that it doesn't lead to, for instance, uh, Disney-like reconstruction and things like that. So I suppose that, that was my reference, but um, you know, it's what you have done, I think, is really demonstrate the need for, you know, within the vernacular, to, you know, the, the relationship between the living landscape the, the you know and the buildings themselves they 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 can't be taken one on their own yeah we are uh, we were we were very worried about uh, theater like or uh, those disneyland like uh, restructuring projects in haran that's why we were in, involved in the project as uh, consultants uh, in order to make it more social more economic a livable city instead of being a theater uh, uh, for tourists uh, there are funds, uh, and uh, but they are national funds. Uh, they are using for uh, renovation of those buildings. Uh, local or national funds are used, but European Union is not involved in this process. Uh, if only they were, uh, so they can control the uh, process way better. Uh, because in Turkey, sometimes uh, uh, things get worse when we are trying to make it better. Uh, yes, but well, maybe. Uh, it would, maybe it would be worth um, seeing, you know, as part of your role as a, as consultants, whether they, you know, how how relevant they are. Mire has sent through the link very usefully for anybody who is interested. Mm -hmm. But it's a great project. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. I, I think uh, um, I apologize, but we have to uh, probably cut our conversation short. It's very very rich in uh, in, in a lot of things. Um, I, I know that the, I, I sent a, a note to Marion on the issue of energy and um, and heritage. It's a, it's a global topic that we have to solve. But I will have to stop myself here, and um, uh, we will have to have more of these conversations. <laughs>